coming. It's a celebration of our state flower today. The rhododendron, who knew that was our state flower? We've got a couple. So here's the question, what's the state tree? Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everyone says Doug for Western Hemlock, actually. Yeah. There you go. So thanks for coming. Um, you can see outside we got our truck show going today. So you can talk to the Rotary Society folks up in the class as well. They'll be showing off all kinds of cool flowers out there. Um, they'll be here until about 2. And then we've got a big sale going. So for you guys, you got 20% off on Rotary's Azaleas. you got 20% off the fertilizer, um, everything you need. So we'll celebrate a little Rotary's. Hopefully you'll find a couple. The, the uh, delayed spring, we'll call it. No lack of sunshine here for about six weeks. Everything is starting to bloom now. So there's lots of eye candy out there to, to kind of watch. So. We'll go through here uh, fast and furious. I got a lot of slides here on the roadies and hopefully show you a couple of uh, the kind of cool ones too. So an easy one here, you know, rhododendron and azalea is the perfect spring blooming shrub. I mean, it is the classic Northwest, Pacific Northwest plant. Roadies grow all over the world, to be honest with you. Even the tropics, uh, which are we can't grow here outside, but uh, rhododendron is a pretty vast genus of plants. Um, some folks on the East Coast, different areas of the country can grow them. Their selection is much more limited than we have here with our typical mild winters. We can grow just about any rhododendron um, around, the, around the area. Um, Rhodes always bloom on old wood. If you've been to my pruning classes before, we always talk about when to prune things. You know, does it bloom on new wood? Does it bloom on old wood? You know, easiest case that, what is going to happen if I go out and prune my rhodi in early spring or winter or fall? I'm going to cut off on my flower buds. So we would always prune rhodi azalea after flowering. That's the perfect time. Here as we get into May, June, they're done blooming. If we're going to prune, that's our best opportunity to do it. Uh, so they bloom maximum again the next spring. Um, it's easy to kind of prune rhodis. You know, if you talk, if you talk, you know, we've got our flowers, we get our little dry trusses. If you're OCD like me, you walk out and pick all the sticky flowers off. Usually I try to get most of mine that aren't on a ladder. Um, so we do a little deadheading. If you don't want to do that and you are going to prune, let the blooms kind of shrivel and finish their bloom time. They cut down below that point. You're just going to get more branching, more little florets, and then more flower for next year. So if you don't want to deadhead necessarily and you are going to prune, you can kind of get it all done in one fell swoop. Azaleas are an interesting one because I do both ways in my yard. You know, some azaleas we would lightly prune here and there if you wanted to, if you like the open you know, kind of woodland effect to them. Um, that's an easy way to go. If you see magazines, maybe you watch the Masters on TV golf here a couple weeks ago, you see azaleas and arboretums, they're thick, they're bushy, and they're covered in flowers. So if I shear them real lightly after flowering, I'm gonna have a gigantic bloom again the next year. So maybe if your azalea is a little bit sparse and open and you'd rather have a little bushy or denser plant, for every stem I cut, I'm going to get two or three new ones, which means double, triple the flower going into the next season. Okay. Uh, so you shear it? No, I'm not saying you have to do that because no, I don't. I, I don't necessarily do that with all mine. But if I want a lower, denser plant, maybe not an ice cube or a triangle, yeah. but if you just kind of gently round them off, you're going to have a much thicker, denser plant, an attractive azalea. And again. If you saw my Hino Crimson, I didn't bring it in here today, but if I Hino Crimson in my yard, I can't even see the leaves right now. It is just covered in red flowers here this month. Yes, so. I have a very old... Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do questions here at the end. We're going we're gonna to keep going. we got lots of time for questions, okay? Um, so pruning real quick, we do the roadies, both old wood bloomers, but we will be a little more careful with the rhododendron. I always have the one-third rule which I've broken on Rody before, to be honest, in my yard. We don't want to cut more than a third of the plant back. Sometimes it doesn't come back so well. I think probably most gardeners have really cut a rhododendron back and had it leaf back out and start growing. It's not very pretty for a year or two, but it does recover and, and, and usually grow, okay? If this time of year, we're always talking about fertilizing, you know, coming out of winter. I mentioned the foods on sale here for the class today. Um, if you fertilize now, you know, that's going to help you with a flush of growth for next season. You know, what's, what's done is done. If I don't have flower buds, that's not going to fix my spring bloom this year. But if I get a good dose of fertilizer on it right now, sometimes a little off color coming out of winter. We looked at some samples, a little light, a little yellow. That's always going to help you. If I feed again here in like June, July, that is what's going to help me with that second push of growth and a, a more bud set 
for the next season flower, if that makes sense. You'll see I've got, you know, we only use this on rhododendron, azalea, camellias, our acid-loving plants, but I also brought up that Ultra Bloom, and that's something I only discovered a few years ago. If I had a rhodi that was maybe a little tired, doesn't bloom quite as nice anymore, that would be a great amendment to throw out there later May, early June, because that's pure phosphorus and potassium, no nitrogen in there. So I've got a healthy green plant that's just not blooming. That's going to give me a chance to get way better bud set again for the next season. So that's a lot of folks, not a lot of plants besides Rhodi as well. But if we put that down, that's going to probably maximize my flower count going in as we set buds this summer that open up in spring 2024. Okay. Now container growing plants, you know, Rhodi Azalea is always going to have a pretty shallow root system. If you're growing them in your yard, this isn't something that sends a big tap root down. So yes, we can grow them in pots, we can grow all plants in containers, but you're not going to get a huge long span, of, to be honest with you, with the rhodi growing in a pot. It's going to get really root bound because we're so shallow. We could have a big broad container that's not super deep. That might be a better way to go for a longer term. The reason I always put that on is because um, sometimes when we grow them in pots, we get potting soil. We want to get a broad pot and we want to get acidic potting soil. You'll see that pink bag I brought up right here. That's a specific hybrid soil that we can use to plant directly into if we're doing things that like acid soil. Or I could take that home, mix it into my planting hole and use it with my rhododendron as well. So that kind of serves both purposes. For us here at the nursery, those are the two kinds of plants we get. Container grown and field dug. So a lot of times you'll see a, a typical rhodi like that in a two gallon pot, that's been grown in a can for its whole life. It's a little bit lighter weight, probably a nice fibrous root system. It's got everything it needs in there and it's been happy to send me in, in bloom, but it's maybe the most common type of rhodi. If I want a bigger one, you'll see the yellow one in the middle there in the front. Now that's field dug. So we have a few growers up in Arlington here and a bunch down in Oregon that will actually dig larger plants with the roots and soil intact, put them in a pot to ship up to us to have the selling spring. So maybe I get a little bit larger plant while I'm doing a field grown pot. We're not going to break it apart. It might be heavier. It's not clay. Sometimes it looks a little heavier like clay, but it's still something we would transplant right into our soil just like we would a container one. These guys, maybe I grab my hori hori knife or my pruner tip and I just lightly score the roots a little bit so that that plant says, okay, I got some fresh soil, let's start growing. The field ones, we're not gonna wanna dig apart like that. We wanna carefully take it out of the pot, put it in the ground as it is, add our fertilizer, and then off we go. Okay, is that kind of making sense? That's a lot with the plants around here, period. Some things get field dug, other things, again, can grow. Now, all organic fertilizers have what we call mycorrhizae in them. Rhododendron azalea, honestly doesn't care about mycorrhizae. There's certain plants that really don't attach to that beneficial fungus in the soil. But we would still use an organic for all the trace elements. So if maybe you're buying food today, typically we recommend Sure Start, you know, when we're transplanting things. A nice gentle fertilizer to get the roots going, get everything kicking. There's no need to buy both. If you're going to buy food today, just get the rhododendron food. We put that on new ones and we can feed it on our existing ones as well. You saw the acid planting mix. You know, again, this is kind of the, a new thing in the industry here the last few years where we have these hybrid soils that work as an amendment that I can dig a hole, use a third of that with my native dirt, use that mixture as a happy medium to start growing a new plant, or I could pour that bag right into a container, plant an acid-loving plant in it, and off we go. I don't have rhodes in pots. I have them in the ground at my place, but that's what I use for planting my blueberries, you know, when I put blueberries in pots or other plants that do like a little bit of acidity, okay? Now, don't forget mulch. That's a huge thing up here as we finally get one sunny day after about seven months of rain, right? I don't know when it was like this. But we have to conserve a little water in the summer. It's always gonna be a warm, dry summer here. We have that Mediterranean climate. And if we mulch, we're gonna, we're gonna have a little happier plants going through that dry season. These are not drought tolerant creatures at all. I want to make sure that's clear. We can't just walk away from an azalea or rhodi and think we're going to get some sort of drought tolerance. It doesn't need water every day. It doesn't need an extraordinary amount, but mulch will really help you. I think a lot of people with established yards like me don't think about watering as much. If I mulch, 
and I soak infrequently in the summer, might only be every week or every two weeks, and I really soak it down, that mulch is going to keep my plants happy, you know, especially shallower rooted plants like or azaleas and rhododendrons. Okay? Be real careful when you're mulch, because a common thing, I have people come back and say, you know, I put bark down, which isn't the end of the world, or compost, whatever it is, but we never ever want to bury up around the trunk. We want to keep that soil level the same. You can go a little deeper out here, I'm fine with that, but we got to be really careful around the crowns, especially on azaleas with those little twiggy centers to them. If we bury mulch up down there, you're going to have problems in a couple years. You're going to start losing stems and maybe rotting out a little bit, okay? Now you see sure start there, I didn't bring it in. You'll see the rhododendron food. Um, that's a great acidic fertilizer again. I could probably name, you know, 90% of all of our yards and that is a good fertilizer to use on all of it. You know, somebody asked me before class about conifers, arborvitae, our hedges, things like that. Rhodi food's not gonna hurt, but I might want a little bit more nitrogen because I'm just looking for green. This is gonna have a little more balanced fertilizer, nice green color, good bud set and then happy root system going into another year. Now there's the Ultra Bloom. You can see the lavender bag. And I put that on a lot of stuff in my yard. I put it on my roadies now because I've seen triple the flower count every year. I do it on my azaleas. I use it on dahlias. I use it in my pots, my hanging baskets, all the above. Because that's not, again, about any kind of growth. That's just about maximizing my flower. So that might be something to try if you haven't tried it. We seem to sell more and more of that every single season. Now if we talk kind of roadies first, we're going to do roadies, we're going to do azaleas, and then we're going to do deciduous azaleas. So we'll kind of have three little sections to this. But if we talk about rhododendrons first, you know, I always kind of give a couple of tips here. Foliage size matters, okay, and color matters. Sun versus shade. You know, all rhododendrons are going to thrive in parts on part shade. I think we've seen them all over this area, underneath trees, edge of the garden, a woodland setting. They're all going to grow great there. It's when I have the, the extreme full sun or total shade, deep dark shade, that's where I probably have to be a little more careful. How many people have a roadie that's leggy and stretching out towards the daylight? You know, I'll raise my hand because I inherited one when I bought my house. You know, is it the end of the world? No, but I would like a little tidier plant maybe. That's a rhododendron that's probably in too much shade. It's leggy, it's stretching out for sun. Some varieties grow like that a little bit. Uh, but that's usually a case where I need to change the location a little bit. The same in the opposite. How many people last summer had a roadie look great all spring? We got to July and you're like, what's happened? I got brown all over the tops of the foliage. I got sunburn for the same opposite reason. I got that plant out in too much afternoon sun. You know, as a general rule, the bigger the leaf, probably the more shade tolerance. That's kind of a vague one, but it is pretty true. If the, I look at a plant and I'm choosing and I look at larger foliage ones, those are going to typically like a little bit more morning sun to shade. The tighter foliage ones, a little bit smaller, I can probably get away with more in full sun with afternoon sun as well. Okay? Um, if you look at the bloom time, now you'll, we don't want to get, turn this into a roadie class. You can see most of them, them out there blooming at the show. Um, as far as bloom time, we got very early, early, mid mid late late we can schedule it out into a bunch of different bloom times we could feasibly have an arodi on a typical year blooming even sometimes late february early march all the way into june is going to be my later one so this isn't just a april it's not just a may it's the entire spring and if you look at varieties they're going to tell you right on there average bloom time is going to be very late late mid early mid whatever that season is so you can kind of pick when you want your pop. Some people like everything blooming at once. You've got kind of a kaleidoscope of different colors. I like to stage mine. I want to see a couple bloom, a couple more bloom, a couple more bloom, <coughs> so that I've got a, a little longer spring of flowers as well. So look at your bloom time. Like I mentioned, pruning back a, a third of a height and spread is about the most. Now look at dwarf rhododendrons. I brought one up here, the Baden Baden. But if I look out there, I think a lot of people look at dwarf rhododendrons and think azalea. Small foliage, simple little flower like an azalea. They tend to be covered. I have a lot in my own yard. Those are going to probably give you the most superior sun tolerance. Short growth habit, easy to grow. I don't think you'd ever have to prune them. I've never touched mine in 20 years. 
but I would get a lot of flower power on a shorter two, maybe three foot plant that can tolerate quite a bit more sun, okay? We've got a section of those out there. You know, flowers come and go, and that's why I said pick a foliage you like. We all know roadies, this isn't a plant that's gonna bloom for five months of the year, it's gonna bloom for about four or six weeks here in spring. So pick a, a leaf you like too. You're gonna to enjoy the flower, but you're gonna look at that foliage the majority of the season. So if you're attracted to that shape, that particular shade of green, maybe it's variegated. We got some really cool variegated roadies out there. Even some ones with injumentum. Does everyone know that word? That's a fancy word. <clears throat> I should patch around. If that's one right there, they call it yak rhododendron. It's this little pink guy in the front. I'll show you after class. If you go touch them, they feel like velvet underneath. Really cool rhododendrons. That's going to have some extra foliage interest with some color on the new growth as well. Okay. Now I'm kind of old. I'm an old school guy. I'm getting a whiter beard every year, and I like my old varieties of rhododendrons. I also like some really cool new ones too. So I can speak for us. You know, since I do most of the buying here for plants. We're always going to have a nice mix. There's still some great old classics. I wish we had even more. Some have really become hard to find. You know, we're always going to have those around as options because they're great plants. They've been around for 50, 60, 70, 80 years a lot of times, and they're still great garden varieties. There are a lot of cool new ones, not as many as there used to be, um, coming down the pipeline as well that we can have some fun with some new colors as well. So we'll always have to have a mix of both of those around here. Now you'll see. As we look through some pictures, you know, we talk about spotting, we talk about blotches. A lot of people that come in and ask me, hey, I saw this old roadie that was white and it had a purple blotch, or it was red and I could see pink in the middle, or I could see freckles or spotting. More interesting flowers, right? We can got a lot of options out there with 5,000 plus rhododendron hybrids out in the tray. There's a lot to choose from. But that might be of interest to you as well. Look at the pictures. Most of ours have a color tag, or when they're blooming, and I can see, I like a simple solid color. No, I want to see that contrast with the darker blotch in the center as well. You'll see some of those. And a big one for me is look at the hardiness zone. I can only speak for me. I live in the middle of Everett. I think I got down to seven twice in December. Um, I'm surprised I didn't, I didn't lose more plants than I did because I'm in zone denial like most gardeners and trying to grow things they probably shouldn't be growing around here. Um, so a few things went to the compost bin already. I didn't lose any of my roadie buds, which is excellent because I do have a couple that are kind of right on the hardy line as far as not death, but nothing's worse than growing a roadie, having a hundred buds on it, ready for spring, and then they all turn brown when they get cold. So then we got to wait till next year again. Um, but pay attention to hardiness. You know, there's always going to be a temperature rating on it, but roadies are maybe a little bit different than most plants. Everyone kind of thinks we're like, who thinks we're zone eight? That always makes me laugh. The computer says you're zone 8. I would say we're zone 7 to be safe. Uh, but if we look at roadies, they're H1, H2, H3, and then H4, H5, it goes up. H3 is right at that 10, 20 degree level. So typically H3s are okay around here. And that's going to be a lot of your fun ones. The oranges, the multicolors, a lot of the ones I think people see and gravitate towards. H1 is going to be our 20, 30 below zero. That's the stuff we see on the East Coast. Um, they're not bad rhododendrons, but they're probably more common ones that you would see big, bushy, huge, even tree-like a lot of times um, that would be a little hardier, though. I would not have to worry about uh, any kind of winter around here, okay? So pay attention to that a little bit. Now, if we look at some pictures here, here's some foliage. So if you see that first one there, looks like it has powdery mildew, right? It's all gray. So that's in Jumentum. If that new leaf comes out, I might have cinnamon color, I might have gray. I've got different colors I have on that. The whole leaf is covered with that velvet. Eventually, I could take my finger and rub it off the top. Eventually, Mother Nature will do that for you, but it always stays on the bottom. A lot of the insect folks around have figured out rhododendrons with in Jumentum, that's a huge barrier for something like lace bug or root weevil or other insects that might get in our rhododendrons. I wish more people bought what we call yak, Y-A-K, or Yakusha manum type rhododendrons. Those were all from Japan. They would all have injumentum. Short, bushy, compact, they take some shade. You're always gonna have a mix of dark pink, light pink, white kind of color tones on those, but excellent foliage and really easy to grow. I see more and more 
out and about as I look in yards in spring, but certainly want to consider, especially if you've got that morning sun sh to shade area, those aren't going to like a, a huge amount of afternoon sun, but very, very easy to grow. You'll see some variegated stuff out there. Mainly for us, it's President Roosevelt, the old red and white American flower with the, with the gold variegated foliage, or Gold Flimmer. We get, I always do the Bond song, Gold Finger, right? So Gold, gold Finger, it'll call Gold Flimmer. Um, that one, we would see the yellow variegation as well, and like a little kind of lilac-y purple flower. So we've got a couple options for variegated. You'll see Ponta come out there. That's a species rhododendron with a more purple flower, big bushy grower, that's going to have white and green on it together. Another nice foliage one if you like a little <coughs> bit of color. You'll see some stuff that turns in the winter. You know, I love PJMs. Um, that's the one that on the on this on the winter side there. PJM is an old-fashioned rhododendron that are really indestructible, super hardy. They look more like an azalea flower here earlier spring. But I love them because in the winter time we would turn mahogany or purple or different color, not lose our leaves but stay there with a the little winter color and then we're back to green come springtime again. You'll see stuff with new growth color. That's one called Otsbo's Red Elizabeth right there. It'll have green with bright burgundy new leaves and then a big red flower on that. Those are blooming out there right now as well. If you look at when they're throwing their growth out, again, I can add another season of interest besides just the flower. Lots of good white ones. For some reason, white's becoming more popular again. Everyone wants white roses, white annuals, everything. White goes with everything, right? So white flowers, we do have a few out there. Um, you'll see stuff like Snow Lady. That's a really early bloomer. Shinoides is an old classic one, super hardy. Big, bushy, broad one if I'm looking for a big white color. You'll see the picture of the Cunninghams there in the landscape. Same idea big bushy broad shape to that would be a nice one and then again we mentioned blotches earlier nothing's I think prettier than that purple on white that's a really striking flower it used to be old Sappho was the one that everybody had which was a leggy rangy roadie that was really pretty in flower and probably not so pretty the other 10 months of the year so you won't find Sappho around much anymore and a lot of people grow it um, but we have flowers that look like that now on much more attractive plants like Picobello, we've got some of those out there. Calsap is another one, we have some out there as well. If we do some orange, <clears throat> that Seaview Sunset's from my yard, mine's in full bloom right now. And I think that's about as close to orange as we get on Rhodey. Those two right there, Neon, Seaview Sunset. We've got some Lem's Tangerine, one called Wild Ginger. We got some fun ones out there. You're never gonna get that, <coughs> excuse me, that pumpkin pumpkin orange. They look very orange red when they're in bud, and then when they open, typically I'll have yellow mixed with the orange and the red in there as well. So you'll see a lot of those blooming if you like those colors, but that's our kind of H3. Most of the orange ones are gonna be right on the, <coughs> excuse me, the hardy line around here as far as not losing buds over the winter. Yellows, lots of good yellows. That's my favorite color, I'll be honest, with the rhodi flower. Um, you know, I think this slide right here is the perfect example of kind of old school and new school. Hotai has been around for, I think, 80 years now. Anybody comes to me and says, I want canary yellow rhododendron, and I like a big old classic one, Hotai is always going to be my answer. That is a great yellow. The <coughs> one you see around in a lot of gardens, a little bit of afternoon shade is best, but certainly a, a great yellow one here for spring. That one's just about ready to bloom. On the other side there, Horizon Monarch is one of my new favorite yellows. So that is one um, from a family breeder down on the Oregon coast that has created a whole series, Horizon Monarch, Horizon Serenity, there's quite a few in that series, but this yellow one, big huge leaves, massive flower, that's one we got extra this year, because um, that's one I, I think our staff really likes too, that's a big impressive plant, a little bit more on the modern side. <coughs> Probably of all the yellows, <coughs> there's one right over here. Uh, we go through more Nancy Evans than anything here. That again is going to look like a little orangey red and bud, and that bright yellow when the flower comes out with a little extra color in there. But probably for flower power and for size, that one's not super large, usually about four feet is all. 
that one usually is a, is a quick, uh, quick, quick choice for most gardeners. And again, another modern one like Lemon Dream, Capistrano. We've got a bunch of good yellows out there. If you're looking for maybe, again, a little bit more compact, a little tidier plant, you can try some of the new ones. The pinks we typically see <coughs> a lot of the good blotching on. These are some pretty fun flowers if you like pink. Uh, I don't think there's a prettier pink than Cherry Cheesecake. That's not a huge new one. I think that name is perfect. Looks just like Cherry Cheesecake. I'm ready to take a bite. Um, but that one I'm going to have a, a nice color, an edge color, and a striking blotch. I think that's about as good as it gets for an, an interesting pink one. Cosmopolitan is an old classic. I know the uh, breeders outside here brought some in to show their flowers are open. That's one we sell as well where I'm going to see that two-tone pink again with that really nice blotch on the flower. <coughs> and then here's again another great example to me of, of old school meets new school here. Anna Rose Whitney. Probably somebody's got old Anna Rose in their yard. That's one of those we call the garage barriers. You know, we got an old roadie that gets about 10 feet by 10 feet if you don't prune it. Big tree specimen with probably the largest of any of the pink flowers. We just got some more of those in. That's a huge orchid pink uh, that would give you a large plant if I'm looking for a big specimen. Then on the other side there, Melrose Flash. That almost looks like an Asiatic lily. That is such a pretty flower. Uh, we get a bunch of those in these days. We just got more because that again is more modern with that edge, pickety edge color on the flower, multiple shades, and that really striking kind of limey green yellow throat as well. If we look at red, this is the week, everything's late again because we've had such a cold spring, but this is usually a two weeks ago. Everybody comes in here and says, I'm driving through Marysville. What's that gigantic, bright fire engine red rodent that's blooming? It's always Taurus. That's always the first one to go. Um, they brought some big flowers in a Taurus. They've got a couple great ones out there at the uh, flower show today. Um, that is a massive dark red. That's another big, big plant. Asked one of the guys to show you his cell phone. He showed me this morning, look at my Taurus. I would say it's 12 feet by 12 feet over the top of the edge of his house and it is covered red right now. It's just spectacular. So if I'm looking for a big specimen red, Taurus is probably the tallest. Jean Marie would be a great one. Both these are, red's a great color for sun, I'll tell you right now. So we could do these in sun too. Jean Marie is another classic old fashioned. That's the one you typically see even sometimes in commercial plantings where they want red color, nice bushy habit maybe six feet tall down the road, not super huge, but very heat tolerant. Jean Marie de Montague is a very great one. We've got stuff like Vulcan, a little bit shorter. You know, if I don't want quite that tall, maybe a little darker red. Uh, Vulcan's one we have out there. Um, it's a nice little variety. And then Elizabeth, you can see the difference is we've got those bell flowers, And you'll see some Elizabeth out there blooming as well. It's not maybe the big truss, but I would have large bell flowers on the tips of those that are kind of fun as they bloom as well. Got lots of purples out there. That's usually always a popular color around here. Probably purple and the yellows are the top two. Um, you know, there's some great old purples. There's some great new ones. Uh, Polar Knocked is probably the best, best one we carry if you were gonna pick a purple for nice flower color and a nice compact habit, not super big. Um, I would always go steady towards Polar Noct. I think that's a really easy one to grow. <clears throat> Blooms a little bit later in the spring, which is nice. We're past the rain. That's usually a May bloomer anyway. They haven't even started to open yet uh, with the cold weather. So Polar Noct might be one to choose. You can see some old ones like <clears throat> Blue Peter. Going to be more for part shade on that one. But that's going to give me the lavender purple again with that beautiful blotch in it. I've got some Blue Peter out there. The darkest one of all time by far is Purple Splendor. So everybody who asks for super dark black purple with the black blacks even makes it darker. Purple Splendor is the way to go. Um, that's probably not the bushiest plant. It's going to be a little bit more open as it grows. Um, but certainly if you like purple, that's, that's an option as well. Um, and don't forget about the small, the small ones like Blue Baron. We have Blue Diamond. We got Bob's Blue. A lot of those really nice blue to purple small flowers, rhododendron, small leaves, very sun tolerant, very compact, easy to grow. And that's again, Blue Baron's been in full bloom about a month or six weeks ago in my yard. I have a big one of those 
and that's one that blooms a little bit earlier as well for, for color. Now if we just mention a couple things on roadies, I always try to pick three or four things that I think the majority of our customers bring me little plastic bags in to say what's wrong with my plant. Um, so these are the things you'll probably see around mostly in our yard. The easy one is always root weevil. You look at that picture and you probably shake your head. Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen my leaves. I got little bite marks at the edge. Root weevil's everywhere. I mean, it's in my yard, your yard, everybody's yard. It's not going anywhere. It's not the end of the world. It's not gonna kill the plant, but I've seen some pretty eaten leaves of, by root weevil. Not just roadie, but other plants as well. Laurel and viburnums and other plants. Um, you know, that's a little creature. It's kind of a cool little insect to be honest, but they crawl up at night when you'll never catch them. <clears throat> they eat their dinner, lunch, breakfast all at once, and then they crawl back into the soil and hide before the sun comes up. So you're not going to be able to spray them, I hate to say, unless we use systemic, which we try to avoid the murder, death, kill systemic. So I would try to shy you away from that because we would spray with systemic and it would go to the flower and we get our bees, you know, to be brutally honest. So try to use something more on the soil. If we, if you go in the store, we have a little shaker can, it's called Eat. It's not systemic, yes, it, it is a man-made synthetic, it's not organic, but if I'm gonna sprinkle that on my soil underneath the rhododendron, it's very cheap to cover a very large area that'll wash into the soil, I'm not gonna get it on me, and it's gonna kill those larvae down the ground without harming the bees and the pollinators and things above, okay? So that's option one. If you're kind of like me and you're trying to go strictly organic and use nothing synthetic, we'll be back to our grab the double tape, get tangle foot or sticky glue, and we literally would wrap our trunks down above the soil and put that glue or that paste on them. Now when they crawl up, you'll catch them. They're kind of fun the next morning. You go, yes, I got six last night. And you can then you can check them out with the microscope like my eight-year-old does. So, so you can catch them. Then we just keep them from getting into the plant anymore. With the soil temperature up now, you know, this is a now thing. This is not like come to me in July and show me your leaf with bite marks and say, what do I do? If we have some on there and we had it last year, we have to try to break the cycle and so they don't get up on our new leaves. So we would try to get that down here now just to get them out, okay? <coughs> the harder one to me is lace bug. If, if I think everybody around here has got lace bug and I'll raise my hand. It found my yard last year for the first time too. Um, that's a little fly that will get all azalea rhododendron. Doesn't need to be in a rhodi. This is an azalea problem too. If I look at the top of my leaf, that's what it's going to look like. If I flip it over, I'm going to probably see little black dots and all kinds of little patterns on the bottom. That's usually that, to be frank, they're poop for one. And you might even catch some of the larvae because the larva is going to be underneath there until they mature and then the fly flies off to the next plant and the next plant. And they, here we go through. Lace bug's a tough one, I'm going to be honest. Um, you've got to get the spray on there early. Again, I'm going, to not, I'm going to mention systemics, but I try to talk you out of using something like that. Um, I think the Rody Society folks out there would tell you, oh, well, wait till they bloom, then nuke it with the systemic, and maybe you'll get the bugs out of there, and then it's up to your comfort level if you think all that systemic's gone before it blooms again next year, okay? So we might disagree on that one point usually when we talk about it. We'll talk about it again today, I'm sure after class. Um, the other option is we get something natural, either neem oil, okay, is always a great one, or we buy a product that contains spinosad or spinosad. We have Captain Jack's Dead Bug Brew in there, it's always a fun one to say. So either one of those, specifically the, the Captain Jack's, if I spray that and I get it on my leaf, top and bottom, and I get that plant wet, you're going to nuke the larva and you'll win. I mean, that's an easy one. If I do neem oil, the same thing will happen, but I have to get everything covered with neem oil. I can't just, you know, wet the top down and walk away. I got to get up in there and make sure I've got that whole plant covered and you will win as well. I would recommend this. Go Captain Jack's here this time of year. And if you're really worried about it coming back, I think fall's a great time to add a little neem oil. Maybe when you're out on a nice day, Later September, early October, we bust the neem oil out and we kind of get one little protective spray on there to make sure we have nothing left that's going to overwinter for the next season, if that makes sense. Okay? So don't feel alone. <clears throat> I get I don't get as much root weevil anymore. I still get plenty, but I would say 50 people in the last two weeks have already brought me a piece with lace bug on it. I've seen it in my yard, I see it everywhere around this area. Um, so that's one I'd really watch for because they will 
defoliate your plant in a season and you'll end up probably pitching it and come and buy another one so save yourself some money look for that look you can look online and find some more pictures and get that thing protected a well-fed plant is always going to be happy so a little fertilizer will help you as well on the disease end <clears throat> it's those we were just looking at this i looked at this gentleman's bags of goodies here before class already today so if i look at disease these are the two main things i see around here fungal leaf spot is always going to be irregular patches and random nothing in in nature if i have sunburn or some other issue it's going to be a really consistent burn on the edge of the leaf something cultural if i have a spot here and a spot there on the top that ends up burning through the bottom it's almost always fungal leaf spot those leaves will drop at some point you want to rake them up get rid of them we would feed that plant if it was me there's nothing you could do about spraying for either of these things once it's already on there we want to keep it from continuing is the whole purpose so flowers are done new growth comes out that's when i want to apply a good spray to make sure i don't get that same problem on my new leaves again if the mildew is always going to show up on the bottom it doesn't look like rose mildew or you see on your zucchini the powdery gray it's more turn over the leaf and look at it like oh wow that's fun i've got brown and burgundies and reds and grays and all kinds of colors kind of in that pattern that's what mildew on rhododendron is going to look like mainly so both of those things to me is the same thing. We clean up leaves, don't want them sitting as mulch. I don't want that festering on the ground. They go in the compost and get pitched. And then I spray the new growth. If my plant has covered in that right now, I would let it bloom, prune it back, feed it, wait for the new leaves to come out, and now we get to spray on there and hopefully we break the cycle, okay? Now, evergreen azaleas, now i brought a few in here you can see gerard scarlet these are some of the new kimonos the little dwarf ones are awful cute i got some down on the ground here too some old school ones um, but again we can do any color in azalea single or double flower okay but there's no yellow there's no real orange we can do kind of salmony we can do some fun colors but we've got a vast majority of choice but you're not going to find the true yellow and we're not going to find super orange okay um, now this is another one, shade, full sun, part sun. Where do I put my azalea? I have plenty of azaleas in my yard that cook in all day sun, from sun up and sun down. Reds, purples, even a little bit of pink from time to time are okay. If I water, again, I can't, these are not drought tolerant. If I'm going white, lavender, some of those other colors, maybe I want to have morning sun, but a little bit of afternoon shade, so I avoid them getting tired here in the summertime, okay? So we can find a spot, I think, in the yard for most azaleas, very easy. You can see I put it on there again. Clip after bloom if I want compact. I'm not saying that's for everybody. I don't shear a lot of stuff in my yard, and I'm not turning these things into little ice cubes. But when they're done blooming, absolutely, I lightly clip. Not cut it way back, but I lightly clip because, again, the one flower there, I chop that stem, I get three stems come up, short growth, and now i got triple flower next year. So that's why my reds right now, I can't even see leaves on them because they're covered in flowers. Do I do it every year? Probably not, especially on the red one. He's plenty, plenty dense at this point. But you don't have to. If you like the, the open, more woodland look, then don't prune it as much. You'll have a little bit more of an open, taller plant versus something more compact. Um, I would always try to plant groups. I've never in my life put one azalea in the ground and said, okay, I'm good with that. Even if I don't want multiple colors, I'm going to plant three. You know, three in a triangle, 18 inches apart. Let them grow into one impressive plant versus one and one and one kind of thing. So maybe you've got a spot to tuck in one and you've got others already, great. But if you're kind of starting from scratch, look at a clump of them, like three or a little swath of five. <laughs> I think you're going to get a much far superior uh, spring flower display and kind of get a little more continuity uh, to the garden that way. Okay, um, the couple I put on here, now who's, anyone tried Encore Azaleas? Anybody bought them at Lowe's, Home Depot, they shouldn't be buying plants out, that's a different story. So, <laughs> um, it kind of chuckles, because I tried them all, I was like, ooh, that's cool, I'll try one of those, dead, in a year. So be really careful with the, they call these re-blooming or double-blooming Azaleas. That's a new thing the last few years, 
I would love to have anything that blooms twice a year. I'm sure all of you would say the same thing. Sweet, sign me up. But we have to watch winter hardiness. The Encore series in particular is just not reliable up here. If we were doing this class in Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, and the Southeast, absolutely. I have a bunch in my own yard right now because they bloom now and then they rebloom again in the late summer fall. And I would love to have double flower on, on any azalea, period. So I try to find hardier ones that are like that. So the two we get in, I don't have double shot quite yet. They're running late, but we'll have them here quick. That is a whole two zones hardier. So instead of being zone eight, maybe they'll tell you seven even. I hardly see those live through the winter. This would be a zone six. I don't have to worry about bud death in the winter, the plants damaged, all the rest of it. And I would have a nice pink, a red, whatever color I want that again reblooms entirely again late summer fall. The brand new one um, that just came out, it's got a terrible name if you're at my new plant class. It's called Perfecta Mundo, which is just terrible for an azalea name if you ask me. But that one we can do white, pink, purple, red. Those are double flowers. They were they've already been blooming for spring. Spectacular spring color. But again, reblooming in fall from proven winters and much, much hardier. I don't have any issue with that out being zone six as well, okay? Now again, kind of like the roadie, you know, look at winter foliage color. There's quite a few azaleas that don't drop their leaves and not deciduous, but instead of being green, green, green for 10 months, now we get the first frost and I have burgundy foliage or red cast foliage. Again, to me, just more interesting in the landscape instead of more green. So there's quite a few of these that will turn some great colors in the, in the winter, and then right back to green comes spring when they when they bloom. There's some variegation. We get a variegated azalea, and if I like white, green, hot pink flower, you'll see those out there. There's lots of great dwarf ones now. Gumpo azaleas have been around forever. We have white, we have pink. Now we're talking something that's just like a foot tall and 18 inches across, a little mounding azalea, not upright, not stemmy, but dwarf. Kimono, like I showed you there, this is Shanzanetta. We have that one, and the other one's called Maraschino. You can probably guess what color that one is, red. Um, we have both those out there, and those are both fabulous azaleas. I'm looking again for something short and compact with a great flower. It's not ever gonna get very big. Those are both great choices for dwarfs. The last one there, have anyone heard of Satsuki azaleas? That kind of sounds like a fun word. Who likes Satsuki? So Satsuki, is a type of azalea from Japan. The biggest thing with that is super late flower. We, we don't even have these in yet because these would typically bloom here last of May into June. So nice late, late spring color. That'll be a big, huge flower. And the coolest thing with Satsuki's are we would see multiple colors on one plant. If you looked at ours in bloom, there might be one that's all white. Next one's half white, half salmon. Next one's got stripes on it. Next one, and every one of them is different, which I think is pretty cool on an azalea. So you'll see some Satsukis in here pretty quick. If you leave your name on the wish list, I'll give you a heads up when they come in. It won't be much more than another week or two, but we will have some of those as well. Okay. Now here's a few. Hey, thanks. I forgot I put this in there. There's my Hino Crimson last year. So can you see leaves on that right now? That is literally in my yard today, blooming about two weeks later than it last year. Uh, but that is what we get if we lightly shear. You can tell by that picture, it's not an ice cube. I didn't make little meatballs out of them. But they look a little more compact and I maximize my flower that way, right? So that's Hino Crimson, by far the most popular azalea here. We go through probably two to one on Hino Crimson versus any other color out there. That's, that's your stock red. Peggy Ann. Got a few of those left. That's a really fun one with that light center again, that painted edge. That's a great little color. There's my Gerard's fuchsia in my backyard there, that fuchsia purple. I think I brought one of those up here somewhere in front. You'll see that kind of fuchsia purple color to them. You know, that one I chose because, hey, I like that color flower. I wanted a little bit more height where these are in my yard, but that is a perfect example of one that turns purple burgundy in the winter. So I get home from work in January, I look out across the yard, it's like, oh, that is sweet. I got some nice foliage color instead of just more green. And you'll see some other fun ones there. Elsie Lee, double lavender flower. That's a very unusual color for a lot of the hardy azaleas. There's a double shot, that's the watermelon. That's one of those hardier ones that reblooms in the fall, 
Now we can do, see watermelon, there's a white one, we can do red, and we can do purple now. There's four colors of those out as well. And then there's an example of our variegation, that's what's called silver sword. So a great flower again like all azaleas, but now I've got that pretty silver on green foliage to enjoy when it's not blooming. And then last one there, there's your two, Shanzanetta and Maraschino. You've got the two kimono azaleas. That's kind of a newer series of uh, the last few years if I'm looking again for something more compact. And then Gumpos. You can see Gumpo Pink, Gumpo White, and we also get Gumpo Fancy if you like both the colors kind of mixed together. You can have pink and white in the same plant. <clears throat> so there's an example of your Satsuki. If you look at that Ketsutaka, can you see the different colors? That's the same plant. I've got stripes on one, I got salmon, I got white, I got different tones going where I'm having a really interesting floral display in the spring. Now the only couple things I'll show <coughs> for Azalea, we've got leaf gall there. Has anyone ever had leaf gall? <coughs> I've had a couple. Usually I prune it out. That's an easy way. If you wash your plants in your yard, you snip it out of there, throw it in the yard waste, and you're done. If you walk away from it, you'll have all kinds of those really funky fuzzy little balls on the tips of the growth and now we might have to spray with a little copper to try to control it but I would always prune feed it then if I'm worried about it hit it once with a little copper fungicide is very safe to do or see if it comes back and then spray it for sure because you don't want to let your whole plant get leaf gold. Root rot's an easy one that could be a rhododendron or azalea. If I walk out this time of year and my plant is hanging down like it's like it looks like it's dry perhaps but you know full well it's not dry coming out of winter that's usually root rot i don't have an answer for that except don't plant another one in that spot again um root rot is going to be from water table bad drainage too much clay not enough good amendment we want to make sure we have well drained soil for azaleas and rhododendrons if it's too wet in the winter that is what i'm going to have happen to come out i luckily knock on oh this is fake wood i'll knock on that wood it hasn't happened in my yard and I was worried because I did a lot of soil improvement 20 years ago, but I see a lot of people come in, 10 people this week in a bag. What's wrong with my roadie? What's wrong with my azalea? That's always the bad news. I'm like, I'm really sorry to tell you this, but you're gonna have to send that one of the compost deep in the sky and try a different plant there because we, can't, we gotta have good drainage. You can see the roadie, same thing with the azalea. So you saw on that roadie how it almost looked like algae or variegated when we looked at the roadie slide that is what i would see underneath and i showed the azalea side of it with that lace bug doesn't that look delicious i've got little black bugs underneath there and i've got larva crawling um, i see this a lot on azalea in my neighborhood um, i help out the arboretum in everett a lot we've watched for this down there um, this is one you've got to get sprayed for because you'll end up throwing your azaleas away they will discolor and eat that entire plant in the season and you're gone you're done um, so watch lace bug early. It's a little harder to see on those small leaves, but you'll always see that black spotty pattern on the bottom of the foliage if you have lace bug. Same good sprays, neem oil, spinosad would be an easy way to go to take care of it on azalea as well. And then sometimes white flies. You know, white flies are on new growth or just about anything around here. They're on my boxwood right now at my house. We had a little chat last night when I got home. But white flies will always like that nice succulent new growth. So when we get our new foliage out, a lot of times I tell people just do this. Just touch the plant. If I have white fly, you're going to see a few of them hop up into the air and then go right back down to that plant. I don't have to get murder, death, kill again as long as I get something that's safe for the pollinators, maybe wait for it to finish blooming, then I would instantly get that sprayed. Neem oil, insecticidal soap, I could pick probably five, six different nice, easy, natural things to take care of white fly. Okay. And then last one here is the deciduous azalea. Everyone knows when I say deciduous, we're losing our leaves, right? I brought two of them up here. They're a little late. They're usually in leaf right now and starting to flower. But I think deciduous azaleas are becoming more popular again. That's an easy to grow plant that gives me a show-stopping flower. If I want orange, 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 like the color of my truck or a construction cone, you're gonna get deciduous azalea. You're not gonna buy a roadie. You're not gonna get another evergreen azalea. You're gonna buy a Gibraltar or Ornison's Jam or one of these deciduous ones that are just glowing orange. That's the only way you're gonna get that and probably, again, another option for bright, bright yellow. 
So there's a lot of good deciduous azaleas. We got quite a few out there because that is one of my favorite plants too. But now we add in excellent fall color. You know, if we have deciduous azalea, we're going to have great fall color in the fall. Bright flowers again, including the orange and yellow. A lot of fragrance a lot of times. Look at your options because this is the one that I'm going to get a pleasing fragrance from on a lot of varieties. We've got a lot of fragrant ones out there as well. There's a huge number of these out there. A lot of people kind of call these Exbury azaleas, which is somewhat accurate, but there's Exbury azaleas. There's also other types of deciduous azaleas, but I think a lot of customers think Exbury azalea. That's fine, because what I think you're looking for is simply a deciduous azalea of any kind. Uh, prune after bloom if you're gonna shape. This is a little creature that spent all his energy last summer getting me a nice flower bud set so that I can enjoy it the next year. So don't go out in the fall, don't go summer, fall, winter, early spring, no pruning, you're just cutting off all your flowers. So wait till it blooms, then we can cut it back if we're going to get new foliage, get flower buds set, and then I get to bloom again the next year, okay? I don't think this is a plant that I would ever say you put right in the front of the garden. This is not a border plant, this is not something to put by the front door. This to me is a background plant. I got a nice landscape, layers and mixed and perennials and shrubs. I go back a level or two. Now that's where I put my deciduous azalea. I want to enjoy the flowers are always going to be on top, not on the sides. And I see the bloom when I want to. I've got a little structure. I've got a little height. And then I can enjoy that specimen long term. I'm not going to put it right, right in the front of the bed. It's going to bury something else. And I'll have to look at a lot of the stems during the course of the year. Okay. I would always say... <clears throat> excuse me with these the more sun the better okay we'll see here in a minute when I show you powdery mildew but if we took deciduous azaleas in too much shade that is typically what's going to happen we get too much shade too much wet on them we're going to find a little bit of powdery mildew these like sun we don't have to have all day baking hot afternoon sun but the more sun the better you're going to be happier growth better color and a little bit more blue now there's quite a bit out there you know we get again i said quite a bit of choice in here on deciduous ones you'll see this light series now this is bred back in minnesota um for been around as long as i've been doing this 30 years but we keep getting maybe more color options double flowers different ones in there so we could have white lights golden lights mandarin lights ruby lights red lights you get on and on there's a color of the light series everywhere we don't get all of them but we tend to get the ones that people like, like the reds and the oranges there. Again, you can see by that picture on mandarin lights, that's about as orange as you're gonna get for a flower in a garden in Washington. So if that's your color, it's one I enjoy in my yard that really pops, that's a great choice on something like mandarin lights. Uh, that's my Arneson's gem out in front of my house. It usually is blooming at this class, but it's about a week away with the cold. Uh, Mr. Arneson, long story short is, spent his entire life he's passed away years ago but he spent his entire life down in malala oregon breeding exbury deciduous type azaleas that frankly had superior mildew resistance so if i want big flower i've got some color options out there reds and yellows and oranges and things but i want a big impressive flower on a probably a little tidier plant than some other ones not fragrant i won't say that because they don't smell but great plants and probably a little better foliage maybe than some other ones the other ones out there again in sun are going to be fine but that one i've had out in front of my house for 20 years <clears throat> all day afternoon sun on a bank and it has been spectacular every year golden solitaire is another yellow in his now western azaleas are a little different i just got these in has anyone discovered these yet so uh, sometimes they call these honeysuckle azaleas so the flower is going to look a little like a honeysuckle. The fragrance is excellent. This is one if I'm going to go for smell, uh, I'm going to gravitate towards popsicle, lemon drop, parade, innocence. There's a whole bunch of colors on these. But I'm going to really get a nice pleasing fragrance and again a later bloom. This is something in my yard doesn't even flower until we get to late May into June. So I'm going to have a little later color and a pleasing fragrance to enjoy as well. So you'll see I think I've got both these out there already, and I think I might have one more color. And we'll continue to get these in um, as we go through the spring. 
Old fashioned Exburys, like again, I brought Gibraltar in because everybody wants orange. So there's your best orange right there, Gibraltar. Go write that down and grab. I got probably 50 of them and they're probably gone in a week and then I can't get them again until next year. So if you want orange, grab, <laughs> grab them with the discount today. <coughs> Klondike would be like that if I want golden yellow, super bright golden yellow. That's another one we have a bunch of out there, typically a popular choice. If you want to get into maybe that same look but get a little smell, this is one right here, Irene Coster. So that's a variety of our native western or occidental azalea. If you're going to go native, there you go. That's one we would find growing native in the Pacific Northwest in the mountain woodland region. So named cultivars like that are going to give me the specific color I want, but again, also an excellent fragrance on Irene Coster. That's one that smells very good. You can see Mount St. Helens, everybody knows down Southern Washington, another local one, that's a salmon color. So again, not orange, but if you like that really funky kind of coral salmon color, that's a great choice for you. And that one again, has got nice, light, pleasing fragrance to it as well. <clears throat> now last one here, we we'll saved the bad news for last. So those are the two things that I would watch for on, on, on expiry or deciduous type of zillions. Mildew is always number one. I'm just being honest with you. If you plant that thing in shade, you bury it with other plants, we got no sun, we got bad air circulation, you're going to get powdery mildew. How's that for the honest truth? Mm -hmm. If I don't, you know, if you have good sun, you have air, you keep it open and trim, you probably won't. You know, it's an easy thing, I think, to fight with just something cultural. It's not the plague. It's not gonna die because we get mildew. Don't walk out in July and see one piece of mildew dig the plant up and throw it away and come buy another one. It has mildew for the year, oh well. Probably goes dormant a little bit early. I don't get fall color that year. Now I clean that debris up, get it out of there so I don't have it next year. And I probably knock on my head and say, okay, I either gotta move this to a different place this winter when it's dormant, or <clears throat> I'm gonna get out there and get a spray on it early so I can try to keep the mildew to a minimum, okay? The other one there is the soft light. Now that's a tough one. You can see that plant that literally had leaves green leaves like on the other side there and they're just gone what does a soft light leave me it leaves me the hard midrib of the leaf that it is just gone in two days you walk out and you're like whoa where'd my plant go um i see a lot of these in everett to be honest with you especially north everett driving around like okay i should knock on her door and tell her to tell her to spray for soft light because again it's not going to kill the plant but I would want to plant with some leaves out in the summer. I think everyone would probably raise their hand. Like, yeah, that'd be nice to have some leaves all summer. Um, it's a fly that flies around. That's the hard part is I don't have any magical answer for you to try to catch that fly. But if you see some damage starting in the springtime here, or perhaps want to prevent it, again, if we avoid systemics, is, a, is obviously the no brainer thing that we get the pollinators with. We avoid systemics and we go to something like the spinosad or the neem oil and we try to keep that down to a minimum, okay? I'm not saying if you buy one of these, you're gonna get soft light, that's not what I'm saying. But I just, it, it, it kills me when I see a, a nice old plant like that get covered with it for the year and you're kind of like, oh great, now it's done, I'll see you next year. So just something to watch for, you know, if you see your yard, everybody should be out right now enjoying the sun, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, and watching these things as they open and flower that's going to stick out like a sore thumb. You're going to look at it one day and a few days later go, wait a minute, some of the leaves are gone. What happened? And you're going to see the midrib with everything else just chewed and gone. So, okay, now I'm going to get a spray on there to make sure I don't get any more of that damage. Okay? So that's a lot of rhododendron azalea. Boy, we made it with one minute to spare. Um, like I mentioned, um, you know, this is kind of our rhododendron celebration weekend. We've got great special guests down here today. The American Rhododendron Society is the, the, great, the great group that kind of manages rhododendrons, the database, the selections, registration, as people bring new plants in. Our local chapters, the Pilchuck chapter, um, they're down here kind of volunteering today. We do this truck show every year, which is really fun. I'm going to geek out when I get out of here with the rest of you, hopefully, because they bring down a bunch of flowers I've never seen before, and I may be like, ooh, I have to look for that one. Um, so you'll see some fun flowers out there on um, kind of the truck show. And they're a wealth of information, ask them. You know, they're gonna probably have some different sources that I don't have um, as far as finding some of these fun plants. 
um, in the garden, you know, from species to new hybrids as well. <clears throat> we do a nice thing, I think, every year here at Sunnyside because I love the Rhododendron Society. It's a great nonprofit charity that, that does produce um, and kind of promote rhododendrons in all communities around here that can grow them. So we always have kind of a special thing every year. If you go out there, I'm sure they'd be happy to show you. But we sell, try to sell their plants to you guys um, here at the nursery because you'll have an awful tough time finding one of them to go to their house and go buy a plant from them. So we bring in, they bring in a bunch of gallons of some really fun rhododendrons. Honestly, I already bought five. <laughs> I think I bought five last year and I don't have any room to put them. So I'm usually like, all right, what am I gonna do? I don't know, I'll find somewhere to put it. So I usually end up with mine out the Arboretum, believe it or not, in Everett, because I, I got them planted down there. But there's some really different stuff. I could look out there right now, there's 30 varieties on that table. I've probably never even seen half of them. So a lot of these are really fun. They got color labels on them. Their price, I think, is $18.99. That is not on sale. I want to make sure that's clear because we're doing this for charity. So I hope you guys support helping out with the Rhododendron Society. You buy those plants, you pay full price, but you know that the, the, the majority of the money is going to them, which will, which will help the society and, again, help bring in cool plants and awareness into the community through the society, okay? So 20% off the fertilizer. That should be a purchase for everybody today. Go home and feed your rhododendrons. Like I said before, if you're not, if you're lacking some bud and bloom, get the ultra bloom. I think you'd see a huge difference and not just rhododendron. Anything in the yard, especially old wood bloomers that you just aren't getting the buds on them. Dogwood tree, magnolia, all these things that spend the summer getting flower buds that we enjoy the next year. You've been disappointed with your flower count Get some of that on there here for summer because that is what's going to help these old wood bloomers extra bud set. Okay, roadie food I could probably put on 99% of my yard if I avoided my vegetable garden, my lawn. What else? Probably my roses I would get a rose food for. But other than that, it's not going to hurt anything. That's for all acid-loving plants. We have acid soil here. We're going to have roadie, azalea, camellia, broadleaf shrubs, conifers, on and on and on. I can use that as a good fertilizer for all that stuff, okay? <clears throat> if you're gonna get some amendment, I would never yell at you for buying compost. That works for everything. So if we dig holes, we plant new plants in it, mix a third compost, or if you really wanna give the rhodia azalea an extra kick, get that pink bag. It's about the same price as compost, but you're gonna have a little extra goodies in there and some built-in acidity to help these plants thrive, okay? So is that overload, rhododendron is that overload? Yeah. All right. So we got, we got I got here all day. So we got some questions. Anybody got questions? Yes. I had that gray velvety um, leaf on the. the Ingemenum? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. On my deciduous orange azalea. Azalea? Well, Every if you year. Had, if you had it on the azalea, you've got mildew. I hate to uh, say. Okay. <clears throat> so that would never have ingemenum, just the rhododendron, the yak type rhododendrons. You know, that's the perfect example of the deciduous azalea. It might be, I don't know where you have it located, but mm -hmm. if it's in too much shade, maybe next winter we move it a little bit and it'll probably be better. Yeah. But we can also, not when it's in bloom again, because we want to save our bees, but if we do it before flower or let the flowers do it, and once the leaves are out, we spray it once, you might keep your, your uh, mildew down a little bit this year. Yeah. <coughs> How about transplanting <coughs> of established azaleas? Yeah. So I would always say this with transplanting. I mean, sometimes we got a construction project or something's happening and it's got to move like now in the growing season. But if you can all at all possibly only do it when it's dormant, you're going to have near 100% success if I dig an established plant up and move it in November, December, January, February. This year you probably could have done it through March because we weren't doing anything yet. Uh, but we would move it when it's dormant and we're going to be okay. It's not a hard plant to move or a big rhodes to be honest with you because again we're not digging down three four feet it's going to be a shallower root system but maybe wider okay. um and they usually pretty fibrous azaleas i'd say you'd have no issue moving if you were careful sometimes we get old rhodes there's a couple of mire and i would never move because they're just physically too big but a pretty easy plant to transplant most of the time okay.